Hello everyone, welcome back to another killer concept. Today we've got one that was inspired by the Chucky killer. Yes, I know Chucky came out a while back in that little, but I've been wanting to make another one that's about his size in the game, minuscule. Runs around and be a complete chaos person. This one is called the Gremlin. He's about the same height, pulled from other things, and basically I wanted another fantasy character. We've recently just gotten the Lich with uh, Vecna, and I wanted another fantasy character. So why don't we get right on into it with their basic info. As they were a small little nimble bugger, they are 4.6 meters per second killer, with a terror radius of only 24 meters. Incredibly fast, but quite quiet too. They're used to sneaking up on people. And with that, is included with their tiny height. I know Chucky's considered small in the game, but let's be honest, he is tiny, not short. And he's a gremlin. He's not got many things to have going for him. So his main weapon is literally a rock. Yes, very cliche, but I thought it was very funny. His ability, however, is more mysterious. And let's get right into it. It is called Mental Restraints. The gremlin is able to jump upon other survivors or climb upon them. If any of you have played Victor with the way in which he is with Charlotte, kind of like that can jump up the survivors, but if you sneak up onto them behind them without them really noticing too much, or if you just don't want to jump on them and you get close enough, you can have an option to climb on top of them. This has many benefits. This makes it so the survivor is unable to walk properly and also cause their timing to be off. So if they try and do any skill checks with you on their back, they will have to be careful because they won't always hit when they press the button, which can be incredibly annoying. This also allows you to leave mental clasps within their head, as when you climb onto them, you can shove your hands directly into their head, not damaging them, but they become spectral almost. This, like I said, leaves a mental clasp. And mental clasps are able to be detonated at any point you choose. Any point at all. Though, when you activate this to be able to detonate them, it does take a few seconds where you are stood still, so you cannot do it mid-chase, unfortunately. While you're on top of the survivors, it also gives you an option. Say you placed a mental clasp on the survivor that you're already on top of, and they walk past another survivor. Since you can't place a mental clasp inside of them, you can jump to the other survivor and do the same to them. Alternatively, you don't need to leave a mental clasp, you can just jump to another survivor if you wish instead. But by doing that, you are not able to place that mental clasp on that survivor you just jumped from. So, you have to make a choice, depending on which survivor you want to go after. On top of it being able to explode whenever you want as well, it, detonating them can make survivors scream, and any survivors outside of your terror radius will have their aura shown for like two seconds, if that. That's their ability though, very weird and obscure. But let's get on into their perks. Hex Reinforcement. This one is an incredibly fun one. Uh, you have to personally activate Totem itself. Find one, go up to it and light it. Similar to how survivors light them. But this allows you to summon a duplicate. They are fully AI controlled and have no abilities. They are basically another M1 killer walking around the map with AI controls. So pretty damn stupid, but they have their benefits. You can use this up to two times in the game, making it so you have yourself and two AI controlled killers. Three killers would definitely be a fun way to do it. It's a shame you can't control them though. Perk two is one that helps survivors out a bit. It's called Dark Sight. All survivors in the game have a subtle glow on them, making them stand out more. So say you're looking at a survivor from across the map and you're struggling to see them. This gives them a subtle glow along their outline and that lot, making them stand out from the dark area around them. This ability isn't very good for many people. For beginners, it can be exceedingly helpful and great knowledge for managing to get them to used to know how people look. Next, we go on to perk three. Mechanical Intervention. This perk is similar to Dragon's Breath, but has ever so slight different abilities. Damaging a generator will cause a small device to be placed upon it. This will mean that if a survivor interacts with that generator within 10 seconds, 
they will lose a health state. Not blow the generator, but lose a health state. Tagging this on with Dragon's Breath can make it incredibly powerful and very, very annoying. So, have fun. Without further ado, how about we get on into their lore for the end part of this video? And, like I said, they're a fantasy-esque character, so it's going to be a fantasy-esque lore. They were born just a normal gremlin in a cave. A cave of many other small creatures and goblins and kobolds and all that type of stuff. It was a cave filled with other monsters of small size, as it was a very tight and narrow cave. They learned how to disassemble and mess around with mechanical machinery, as they were taught by their other clan members. After all, family is everything. Though, digging through the loot of other survivors who had died further on in the dungeon, or by other monsters inside the dungeon, who knows where these bodies really came from? He managed to find a magic book. Now, curiosity got the better of him, for he'd never seen a magic book before. Book before. They all knew of them, of course, because it was loot. They sometimes usually piled them in a pile in the back of the cave, because, well, none of them had magic adepts. But the Kremlin decided he wanted to see what was so special about magic, so he opened up the book. Once he opened the book, the pages flickered pie over and over and over until it reached the end of the book as it dissolved in its hands. The book on the front of it had said psionics. It gave him the ability to use psionic powers. There was only one small problem. Because he was a gremlin, he didn't have the ability to be able to use psionics properly. He didn't have the brain capacity, unfortunately. Though, this didn't mean that he couldn't use it. He just had to be physically touching a person to be able to use it. He held this ability bit by bit, practicing on, well, weaker monsters than him, ones that would piss him off. Then he tried it on some humans that came in, looking for stuff. He realized he could implant a small explosive device in their head almost, and make their heads go boom. He eventually started gaining respect from all the other monsters. After all, would you want to fight someone who could just make your head go boom in an instant? I definitely wouldn't. So he started rising up until he was the head of the clan of his gremlins, and then carried on rising from there. He then became the boss of this cave. But why should they live in a cave anymore? Any human came in, died from him, if they didn't get wiped out by the other gremlins and creatures. So humans stopped coming. He grew bored. And bored makes for adventure. So he set out and found the neighboring human village. He ended up taking that over too. He became an overlord, should we say. Could he speak human? No. Of course he couldn't. He was a gremlin. He knew none of the language. He knew nothing of it. He just knew that they had stuff and he wanted it. Gremlins are hoarders, after all, of technology and other knickknacks. But this lasted over a few years. They moved from town to town to town. Little village to little village. Until eventually, the capital of this small area he managed to reach. He took that over too. The king didn't want for his head to blow up, neither did he want his precious daughter to die either. The gremlin had no care for either of them. They were just another set of people. Nothing more than random people. This pissed off the king, and he sent out a message to neighboring cities. Of course, the gremlin didn't stop this message because, well, he couldn't read the message. And what was anyone going to do? No one wanted to stand up against him anyway. The message did eventually reach another kingdom. And a brave adventurer decided to come and find him. He fought for days trying to get to that city. To all of his minions and all of the people who were terrified of him. Unfortunately he also had to cut down many other humans. Who were too terrified to go back to this gremlin and report that they had failed. They didn't know that he couldn't understand English. All they knew is he came into their city and took it. Without much fight at all. Eventually the hero managed to make it all the way to the throne room. It was surrounded by all manner of treasures. Gold items, magical items, books, anything that could be classified as desirable by a person. This gremlin wanted, because no one else can add it but him. A fight ensued. This hero was good. 
had dealt with psionic powers many times before, so he knew what he was dealing with. So, all he had to do was make sure the gremlin didn't get close to him. In a last ditch effort, he found out that there was no way he could stop this guy. So he let him climb on top of him as the gremlin shoved his hands inside of his head, implanting the psionic powers and the bomb inside of his head. Just as the gremlin was about to explode the device, the hero put a knife right through his head. In his last dying breaths, he exploded the adventurer's head. The adventurer had died, but he'd also killed this horrible gremlin that had taken over this area. The entity had been watching from a distance, admiring how such a pathetic small creature could manage to cause so much fear and terror into all these humans. It was tasty. It was just what the entity was looking for. Something to give it more raw emotions from all the other humans it had got. In the gremlin's dying breaths, the entity swooped in and took it to his realm. He held him up and made him stronger than ever. Though, he couldn't do anything about his intelligence, so his psionic powers were still linked to having to hold on to people and run his hands into them. The entity knew that this was going to be a very fun killer to run around the map. One that was too small for the survivors to kill. And he reigned supreme for the first time round. Until we get to the modern day survivors. They notice their small height, but they still have to fight it carefully. So, survivor, how are you going to deal with this small threat sneaking up behind you, ready to make your head go pop? Thank you very much for listening to this show. It means so much that you stayed till this point. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please do leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more of them. I've got plenty more on the way and I've done plenty more in the past, so feel free to go back and check them out. If there's a concept that you would like me to do based off of your favourite film, book, TV show, whatever, let me know and I'll make a killer around it. If you'd like me to make a survivor instead, do let me know and I'll make a survivor based around that person as well. I'm open to either or. And, well, without further ado, this Cerberus is checking all of his electronics to make sure he doesn't have a gremlin rowing around this, well, lair. Ow!